My name is Jerry, and I'm an economist. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am reminded with the title of this conference, you know, we're talking about Title II, Title III, Title VI. Uh, I uh, did a stint at The Economist, uh, at the, yeah, The Economist, um, at the FCC about 15 years ago, and didn't know anything about the place, so I went down and I was there for about a week, and I was, you know, a lot of nice people down there, and I'm talking to them, really getting along with everybody. And um, at one point, we were having a discussion out in the corridor, and people start using terms like Title II and Title III and Title, you know, VI and FOIA and, you know, 706 and stuff like that. And I was like, what, what is this? What's going on here? Okay, and it was then that I realized every last man jack one of them was a lawyer. Okay, and I had that feeling like, I don't know if you saw that Donald Sutherland movie about 30 years ago about invasion of the body snatchers, where it takes him about a quarter of the movie to discover all those really nice people that are smiling and being friendly, they're all aliens. Okay, well, <laughs> I can announce today of our panelists, every last man jack, one of them is a lawyer, so <laughs> be prepared. No, not you. Mm -mm. Oh, okay, He's good. Sure. Good for you. All <laughs> I'm right. not an alien. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, although I guess it's a little strange that, that Christopher asked an economist to come here, because as far as I can tell, at the FCC, although they have dozens of really good economists, there has been absolutely no economist input into the network neutrality debate. None. Okay, and if you read the order, which everybody was, the 210 order, uh, which everybody was lauding up here, there is no evidence whatsoever of economic evidence being adduced to, to that order, okay? So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, the last thing, and I wanna say this about Title II, Title III, and Title VI, um, much of the discussion we've had here um, except by Jeff and Larry, has been, okay, now that we're doing this, how are we going to do it? Okay? Now, I would, maybe it's because I agree with Jeff and, and Larry, I think we're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It seems that many people have decided we're going to have some form of regulation, and that all we're doing right now is deciding what the jurisdiction will be, which is a very lawyerly question. Okay, it, in, in my view, it doesn't make much difference at all. What we're going to be in for is a future where, if these predictions hold true, things will be 100 times slower, much less innovation, and it will be a field day for rent seeking. And we've already seen that started. Um, Larry was, was quite correct. Uh, what we're seeing from the CDNs right now is in fact rent seeking, and that's gonna continue, and that's gonna dominate the internet in the future, if that's what we want. In any case, um, this is the mobile session, okay? <laughs> Guess I got a mobile thing in my ear, just in case, you know, the president calls or anything. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, the panelists have all told me they wanna do this sitting down, that's fine. And so we're going to be going from my right to my left, um, and guys, this will be 10 minutes apiece, okay? Um, first is Russ Hanser. Uh, Russ is a, um, a partner at uh, Wilkinson, um, Barker, and Knauer. Is that the way to pronounce it? Yep. That's good enough, okay. And he focuses on regulation, next generation services, information privacy, and cybersecurity. His clients include wireline and wireless uh, carriers, cable guys, and ISPs. Prior to that, he was an FCC guy. And a lawyer. And a lawyer, yes, right. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, am I on? So uh, I want to start my time by uh, a couple of prefatory notes. So first, thank you very much to uh, Christopher, to the University of Pennsylvania for, for having me here. Uh, I really wanted to sort of throw my uh, appreciation uh, for making UPenn really a, a, one of the handful of universities that's playing a real role in these debates and real, taking on a, le a real leadership role. Uh, there are others, but Penn has you know really lit up the firmament, uh, especially in recent years. Uh, second, I want to say it's really good to see uh, lots of friends in the audience, and it's 
especially good to see several clients in the audience because that means I can call this a conference and bill it. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and third, I was going to throw a virtual hug to Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> to Jeff. Uh, and. and uh, but he's not here, so I'll wait for the virtual hug. Okay, so in the remainder of my 10 minutes, I, I have uh, three main goals. I want to just talk briefly about the core policy issues surrounding uh, mobile net neutrality issues. Uh, second, I want to set out the core legal issues that underpin those policy issues and questions. And then I want to talk about sort of my view uh, slash the view of the people I represent on these issues. Uh, so the core policy issues, I think there are really two of them in the, in the mobile specific space. Uh, all the issues you heard about in the last panel are relevant to the mobile debate, of course. So the first major policy issue, should fixed and mobile broadband services be subject to the same rules? Should they be treated alike? Are there distinctions between fixed and mobile broadband services that warrant different treatment? And then second, I think the question is, regardless of how fixed uh, it's not purely a comparative issue. So regardless of how fixed is treated, how should mobile services be treated given the, the characteristics of those services? What's the appropriate level of regulation? So then there are a couple of core legal questions that uh, I've been asked to address as, as the law firm guy on the panel. So I think the first core legal question is what can we glean, if anything, from what Congress has done in the past with respect to wireless, uh, and particularly with respect to uh, how mobile should be treated for open internet purposes? And then second, uh, and this ties very closely to the last panel, how should wireless or mobile broadband services be classified under Section 3 of the Act? Um, uh, and that, as you've heard, turns uh, in large part on this definition, the distinction between telecom services and information services. It also, in the mobile space, turns on a related uh, distinction between CMRS, commercial mobile radio services, and PMRS, which are private mobile radio <coughs> services. So, so. I've knocked off my first two goals. Uh, so my third goal, I'll take the rest of my time sort of laying out where, where I see the law on, the, on these areas. So the first question, I, the first legal question I identified was this uh, congressional intent question. Uh, Congress has not directly spoken to wireless or, or mobile broadband services in explicit terms. Uh, so so the, really what we need to look at in terms of congressional intent here congressional purpose is the 1993 Act. Uh, there's some stuff in the 96 Act, but principally this 1993 uh, Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, which people often call OBRA. Uh, this, for people who were politically sentient and you know, aware in 1993, was a very important bill. It was the Clinton budget that became a big uh, conflict. Uh, it was a tie in the Senate, some of you may remember, and the new Vice President Al Gore had to come in and cast the deciding vote. Uh, this wireless piece was a small part of that. I don't recall uh, people talking about the wireless debate. But uh, this section <clears throat> in OBRA 93 addressed principally commercial mobile radio service. Uh, and it set wireless services on a very different course. So prior to 93, wireless services had been subject to kind of the same common carrier regime as, as fixed services for the most part. And Congress said, no, we shouldn't quite do it that way. And uh, principally, it did so through two mechanisms. One was before the 96 Act's forbearance mechanism that we hear a lot about, uh, the 93 Act had, over 93, had a forbearance provision with respect to wireless. It said, FCC, there are cases in which you should decide, or you can decide, not to re subject wireless to uh, traditional common carrier regulation. Go forth and do that. In fact, in 1994, before the 96 Act, uh, the FCC did that quite extensively and relieved a lot of obligations. Uh, so a very deregulatory intent toward mobile services. Second, there was a provision calling for a preemption of state action. It said states, you can't regulate prices or entry for wireless wireless services, commercial mobile services. So what we see in, in that uh, Ober 93 paradigm is not direct, uh, well, I'll get a little bit to language that bears directly in this question, but no explicit reference to wireless broadband, which of course didn't exist at the time. But we see a lot of intention to view wireless in a different light and to treat it subject to a, a more centralized, federalized regime and also to a more deregulatory regime. Um, so that brings us to what, what can we work with in the Act when looking at how to treat wireless for, for legal purposes? How am I doing in time? You go. You do okay. Right. So, um, so as you've heard, there's this definition telecommunications, which is transmission without change in form or content. Telecommunications service under the 96 Act is the provision of telecommunications for a fee and broadly to the public or to large classes of the public uh, for a fee, if I didn't say that part already. Um, so on one side, we have the telecom service. That's the heavily regulated stuff under Title II. On the other hand, under the 96 Act, we have information service, which always uses transmission. It always uses telecommunications, but it uses it 
uh, in conjunction with other functionality to enable users to uh, retrieve, store, process information. It's doing something. It's acting on the information. And the core question in the classification debate has been, uh, is broadband internet access the joint provision of a telecom offering and an information service offering. Nobody doubts that there is an information component, and nobody doubts that there is a transmission component. The question is always, is it those two things each individually being provided together, or is it one integrated package? And of course, uh, in the orders that Mark was mentioning in the last panel, the commission held uh, four times that different platforms, uh, wireless, wireline, cable, and broadband over power line. You all have broadband over power line, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that those were all integrated information services. And the debate uh, in the Title II space now is, uh, has that changed? Or I guess in some people's view, was that never the case? Uh, uh, I would say on those issues, uh, it, things have changed in the sense that the service has gotten more integrated, not less. Uh, as we've moved into an era of, of spam and bots and uh, cybersecurity awareness, uh, as we've moved into an era where devices can be running multiple applications at the same time, there's a constant management, there's a constant processing and retrieval and storage of information from multiple sources that is always very closely tied to the transmission. Uh, and that's true for wired and, wire, and wireless, uh, although I've read papers suggesting it's even more true for wireless than for wireline services. In any event, that's probably splitting hairs because across the board, there's a lot of integration. So again, my view, view of people I represent in this area is uh, wireless service, wireless broadband internet access is an integrated information service today, at least as much as it was before. Uh, and then the second, there's a second piece in the wireless analysis, uh, which is the section 30, 332 piece. As I mentioned, this is the provision added by Congress in 93. And section 332 separated the world into private mobile services and commercial mobile services. S commercial mobile services, CMRS, are services that offer interconnection to all points on the network. Uh, and and uh, let's see, I'll, I'll redo the definition. They, uh, do, 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 uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, here we go. So CMRS is any mobile services that is provided for a profit and makes interconnected service available to the public. The FCC has defined that to mean interconnection to all points on the network and that uses NANP numbering, telephone numbering. Uh, private mobile service, on the other hand, is anything else except for that or its functional equivalent, CMRS or its functional equivalent. Well, I think we could all agree that uh, broadband wireless service does not use telephone numbering uh, and does not make access possible to, does not itself make access possible to all points in the public uh, telephone network. There are VoIP applications that do that, of course, but the broadband service doesn't. Uh, and section 332, one minute left. So section 332C2 says quite plainly that a person engaged, I'm sorry, so as a result of not being interconnected, broadband internet access when provided over the mobile platform is a private mobile service, irrespective of this telecom service information service piece. Uh, and as a result, it's subject to this provision, section 332C2, where Congress was quite clear and said that a person engaged in the provision of a service that is a private mobile service shall not, insofar as such person is so engaged, be treated as a common carrier for any purpose under this chapter. Um, so when wireless pro providers are providing regular voice service, sure, that's you know under the CMRS regime, uh, when they're providing broadband internet access service, this is a second backstop. It's a backstop that the DC Circuit recognized uh, uh, and that the FCC, frankly, has recognized in its order. So there's this extra layer in the legal analysis on wireless. And I'll stop there. Wow, that was good. Right on time. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Russ. <laughs> That's my job, moderator. Um, our next speaker is Jeff Mann. He is the executive director uh, and founder of the International Center for Law and Economics, my kind of guy and an expert in the law and economics of antitrust, telecommunications, and intellectual property. He uh, edited the recently published Competition Policy and in Intellectual Property Law Under Uncertainty, Regulating Innovation, a very hot topic these days. Jeff? Jeff Manny. Manny's not there. Manny. That's true. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I do answer to the man, so. <laughs> <laughs> should, I, should I say you to Manny? Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Christopher and Jerry and, and everyone for having me here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to jump right in because 10 minutes is about uh, one-tenth of what I 
would normally speak, do here. You've seen, you know, the way we write things. Uh, Bar Baron and I wrote comments in this in the net neutrality proceeding that were 160 pages or something, <laughs> single spaced. <laughs> Everyone read them all, right? There'll be a, there'll be a quiz later. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, we're 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 here. We're talking about this because of the uh, suggestion that net neutrality principles, whatever they are. Um, should extend beyond the uh, open internet orders principles, even beyond the um, uh, kind of the bare suggestion in the NPRM, uh, and, and that we should impose some sort of common carrier status on, uh, on broadband service providers, and in particular, for purposes of this panel, mobile providers. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a couple of choice quotes here to suggest sort of what the um, what the perceived problem is from public knowledge. The company that connects you to the internet should not be in a position to control what you do on the internet. Tom Wheeler says, if it interferes with the operation of the internet, um, if it does have some kind of preferential treatment given somewhere, then it's cause for us to intervene. Uh, the FCC in several places has warned that ISPs may have an economic incentive to block or disadvantage websites and to charge providers for prioritized access. Um, of particular concern are threats to American innovation. It's this, the, the uh, virtuous circle that we've heard about where uh, innovation apparently only happens on the edge. And, and all that matters is that we, we have this virtuous circle, um, the purpose of which is not to incentivize innovation everywhere in the circle, but to make sure that the edge uh, gets everything that it needs with an implicit and explicit understanding that it is broadband and internet service providers that stand between edge innovation um, uh, of the future and, um, I don't know, the Stone Age. Um, so my question is, is any of this true? And is any of it true on mobile uh, in, in particular? I, I think we're going to debate uh, later and uh, on, on this panel and elsewhere the differences between mobile and, and fixed. Um, uh, I, I don't think that the differences are all that substantial. I think the things I'm going to talk about in a second apply in both in both places. Um, there is one important difference about um, uh, as an engineering an, in, in terms of engineering between mobile and fixed wireless, and that is um, that in in mobile. Uh, all the users on a network are, are sharing and moving between different nodes, meaning each pipe has to be shared in real time between potentially all users uh, in an area which makes managing traffic much more complicated than on a fixed um, on a fixed line where that kind of mobility, by definition, <laughs> doesn't happen. Um, and for that reason, I think it's reasonable to assume that mobile operators need more leeway than fixed providers. Um, uh, and, and for that reason, it's possibly the case that per applying identical, uh, if they're sufficiently restrictive, rules to both would likely hurt the dramatic growth in mobiles or uh, mobile and wireless networks. But with respect to the economics and the business models of the content uh, that's being, op being offered, I don't really see appreciable difference, um, and, uh, and that's what I want to talk about today. So <clears throat> um, the, the real concern is this idea that prioritization, that somehow, that somehow if the broadband service providers are in a position because of a deal with content providers or, uh, or, or simply be, because of their, their intrinsic incentives uh, to, to affect in any possible way what consumers uh, see on the internet or have access to on the internet, that this is a problem that needs to be corrected and arguably needs to be corrected by, by common carriage. There's innumerable examples um, of these kinds of services that presumably would be blocked, that presumably, and in some cases explicitly, again, by the consumer advocates and self-proclaimed consumer advocates anyway, and others um, so, you know, suggest that these are indeed the things that need to be blocked. So I'm going to give a few examples here. Um, these are these are interesting and and novel, although they're becoming you know, sort of so common. I don't know that they're that novel anymore. Um, ways of uh, of operating, uh, in particular, on mobile networks. Um, uh, and offering consumers services, in particular, given uh, that that for right now, I should I guess I should point out that for right now there is one other difference between fixed and mobile networks, and that is there's obviously more scarcity on uh, mobile networks. It won't always be the case, and and it's certainly nothing intrinsic, I think, in the physics of either network that means we will always have terrible and and um, uh, problematic scarcity on mobile networks and not on fixed networks. But right now that is the case. And as a function of that, <clears throat> and probably some other things as well, 
there is a perceived need to, to subsidize what it costs to access some of the, the most interesting new and potentially bandwidth intensive content um, uh, on mobile devices. So you have things like T-Mobile's Unradio, um, where it, it subsidizes consumers' use uh, or uh, access to certain music services. Um, if they subscribe to the service and listen to, to the um, uh, music services that are part of the service, it won't account against their, their, their data uh, uh, limits. Um, it's worth pointing out that in this example, T-Mobile receives no payment from the music services, um, and T-Mobile's users can nominate new services <coughs> And if there's sufficient interest, get their data exempted as well. In the sense, it is a it is a an open access sort of regime, but it is an inherently prioritized regime. It prioritizes music data over other kinds of data, and unless and until every single music provider is included, it prioritizes some music providers over others. There's obvious consumer demand for this. There are obvious consumer benefits from this. I have apparently three and a half minutes left, and and so and about seven pages describing those consumer <laughs> benefits, but, but you can imagine uh, what they might be. Um, uh, there's the classic Metro PCS uh, YouTube example uh, where Metro PCS was a sort of upstart fifth uh, mobile provider trying to find ways to make a to, to get a leg up. Its customers tended to be lower income customers, people who weren't using you know all of the the massive bandwidth intensive services on the internet. They came up with an idea to subsidize um, a certain content. The, content that apparently uh, its subscribers wanted. The outcry was enormous. Um, this was perceived to be a, a net neutrality violation, a violation of the open internet rules, which hadn't actually even been adopted yet. Uh, and, and Metro PCS scrapped the plans uh, entirely. Right now, we have <coughs> the, um, uh, the advent of AT&T sponsored data and a company called Syntonic Wireless that offers something called the Connected Services Platform. These are ways to allow internet content providers to provide application-specific bandwidth to mobile devices. Same sort of deal as I've been describing, although uh, in the AT&T uh, and, and Syntonic examples at a much more granular level, uh, allowing a particular app or, or content provider, for example, to um, uh, you know, to let anyone sample their content without it affecting uh, their uh, data caps. Um, the, uh, the kinds of customers who, who might be um, benefited by this, again, are at minimum those uh, who have, have uh, less intensive demand uh, and who may not have the resources available to consume uh, or to, to purchase a, a data plan or the availability of an amount of data that they're unwilling to pay for and unlikely to use. Um, uh, and then, of course, there are these zero rating plans that are very common throughout uh, the rest of the world. There's Facebook Zero, Google Free Zone, although I think that's uh, not in existence anymore, Twitter Access, Wikipedia Zero. These are all schemes that basically allow you to um, uh, navigate to those particular sites and uh, uh, have your and and any data exchanged when you're when you're viewing those sites won't count against your uh, your data caps or limitations. I, if Mark Cooper was right earlier, I think all of these things. Um, Sorry, if Mark Cooper was right earlier, and we have forbearance the way uh, he suggested we might, none of these things would be prohibited under Title II, at least with, with forbearance. I think that's wrong. I think all of them would potentially be prohibited under Title II. But if it's true, if these things aren't what Title II would be adopted to avoid, um, then the question remains, what is the conceivable justification for adopting <laughs> Title II uh, when the thing that it is supposed to be preventing are exactly these kinds of, um, of prioritization? Um, God, I have so much great stuff to say. You guys want to just yield your time to me? I give you a hug. Manny freedom. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, let me just pick what's the best part. Um, I, I guess the, the, what I really want to suggest here is that on the one hand, um, th it is undeniable that these sorts of business models that have emerged uh, on, on the uh, mobile internet are 
uh, prior, pr prioritization. I mean, every one of them involves uh, some treatment of some data differently than other data. It's not packet prioritization, though. We just need to make that clear. It's right. prioritization of business. These are business, right? Yeah. I, I, absolutely, right. This is this is business model prioritization. This is not an engineering matter, but but that's actually really the point. Is that is that that regulation of uh, um, the, the regulation here is very clearly being pushed by those who have a problem with. The, uh, with the business model prioritization, with the business prioritization, they don't particularly care whether packet A is treated differently than packet B, I think. I'm told I have zero minutes. Um, I'm gonna keep talking until I'm actually shut up. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I will cover some of this in the, in the questions. But the question I would, uh, I would just leave you with is, is uh, whether, the, uh, we, I think we can all understand what the potential benefits here are. I don't think the FCC has done a good job, and I don't think Title II um, does anything to s s systematically weigh these benefits of this kind of prioritization against what may be potential uh, costs. I think it adopts a presumption that there are costs here and that the costs outweigh the benefits, which are essentially discounted to zero. Uh, and that can't be an appropriate way to foster innovation, even on the edge, let alone uh, on the network. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeff. Um, I want to make a point, because uh, Jeff mentioned it in his talk, about scarcity being a key element here about how we regulate, um, uh, if at all, uh, uh, wireless broadband. Um, in a sense, the FCC really holds the key here because the fact that it's a scarce resource is due to the fact that the FCC has not been able to identify enough spectrum to get out there. In principle, the FCC could do so. It seems to be trying, but not really very hard. Um, because if there's a future to pot the, the market structure of the broadband network, it's going to be wireless. And could we imagine a situation in which we had, say, six broadband providers, four of which were wireless? And wouldn't that look pretty competitive? And what are we waiting for, FCC? Let's get that spectrum out there. This is within the FCC's capability of doing this if it could get its act together. So to some extent, we're looking at a problem which is due to an artificial scarcity, in my view, which the FCC could in principle fix. Now, having made that statement, <laughs> let me move to our next speaker, who is um, Nicole Turner-Lee. She is vice president and, oh, and a, not an attorney, she informs me. Yeah, okay, good for you. And yeah. not an alien. I am not an alien. Oh, good. Okay, you'll get an extra two minutes for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, she's vice president and chief research and policy officer for the Min Minority Media and Telecommunications Council. And she is author of the first National Minority Broadband Adoption Study, which was cited in the FCC's National Broadband Plan. Nicole? Thank you, um, and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Chris, for having me here. Um, I was really flexible, <laughs> so stayed up a little later, but I'm here. <laughs> um, I'm going to echo some of what has already been said by many people, and I think I'm going to pick up on some of your points. So you are the man, and uh, so I'll pick those up. Uh, yeah, exactly. And for those of you that don't know MMTC, our particular focus in this whole debate, whether it's Title II, Title III, you know, whatever title you want to name, is on the impact of anything that we do in a regulatory framework on communities of color and vulnerable populations. And that's an area I think that's near and dear to our heart because any kind of tweak in the regulatory framework has the potential to sort of offset some of the progress that we've seen since I published the study that was referenced in 2009. We're just beginning to see an upward tick in the type of broadband adoption that we want to see among vulnerable populations, particularly those that are low income. I see Debbie Berliner in the room, seniors. Uh, not, um, uh, not as abled uh, to move around as many of us in this room, et cetera, have uh, physical disabilities. And I think we need to be sensitive to that fact that if we're trying to solve a basic problem through uh, regulation of universal broadband adoption and deployment, uh, the route that we take has the potential to actually, again, tip the uh, tip the, the steering wheel in a way that it may not be productive. I do want to express that um, in this panel, uh, we have filed at MMTC formal comments on Title II 
uh, application. Uh, we've not necessarily filed on mobile, the application of mobile services, except in the reply comments. And we stand um, as of counsel to 45 national minority organizations across the country that have actually chimed into this debate. So I want to put that out there because some of the things that I'll share today are more pertinent to MMTC than to that coalition of stakeholders. So I'm just going to give three points, and I love your timer because I talk a lot too. So I'm going to try to <laughs> keep it to 10 minutes as well. Uh, yeah, you can put it back on and just nudge me, whatever you want to do. I, I, you took some of my time, though. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to touch upon, like, the conversation that we've had today in terms of the application of the open internet principles to mobile services and uh, whether or not common carrier regulation is actually appropriate. So I'm going to start with my first point, which is the fact that we th should all be thankful that the 2010 principles that we that have, that basically um, have, were put forth, uh, that light touch regulation approach have actually created the wireless ecosystem in which we live today. Many of us come to depend, live, enjoy our mobile devices, and that was not by accident. That came because the 2010 regulatory principles created a pathway for that type of wireless explosion that many of us are highly dependent upon. And I think to ignore that fact, whether you are uh, African American, Latino, mainstream, you know, educated, etc., is, is something that you're fooling yourself because that's basically how we got to this point today. Um, some of you stood in line for that iPhone 6, so you know what I'm talking about when it comes to that. And for people of color, it's particularly exciting because mobile has provided a pathway to creating what we call at MMTC first class digital citizenship. It actually has engaged more people of color, uh, particularly underserved in underserved communities, to be more engaged in the internet ecosystem. So I wanted to share a couple of stats, which I think are really exciting to, to point out. In the case of Latinos, for example, 72% of Hispanic adults over 18 own smartphones, which is nearly 10 percentage points higher than the national average. When it comes to smartphone usage, for example, 52% of Hispanic consumers use their smartphone to watch, download, stream video versus 37% of non-Hispanics. And 49% of Hispanic consumers said they plan to upgrade their smartphone in the next six months. That is surprisingly important to note because in 2009, when we did the National Minority Broadband Study at the Joint Center, those numbers were pretty flat. We were still calling uh, uh, cell phone devices, uh, mobile devices, cell phones. <laughs> they were not smartphones when we actually did that study in 2009. So in some, we're actually seeing a reliance upon Latinos on this um, medium. And what's more important is that they're using their wireless devices for educational and other public good and individual good applications, whether it's related to school work or personal management. That's a good news story for us in the community. For African Americans, we're seeing similar upward, uh, upward trends when it comes to wireless services. 89% of African Americans consider their wireless service an essential service in their everyday life, myself included. 69% <laughs> of African Americans use a device for things related to work, school, or personal management. And 58% of African American users um, basically are not, you know, going to replace their wireless device when it comes to uh, that dependence. These trends are also consistent, if I had more time, with rural communities as well as uh, low income and people without high school degrees. And these trends suggest, I think, you know, that it's not broken, so why are we trying to change it? <laughs> um, and my grandmother, you know, used to say that to us all the time, because one of the fundamental concerns, I think, about the value of net neutrality, which I think all of us in this room overwhelmingly agree to open internet principles, is that we should be looking for ways to now digital disparities that exist, particularly among these populations. Um, I have a neighbor who is actually growing a garden. She's been doing it all summer. And what's so neat about it is her garden has kind of grown out versus up. And when I think about the imposition of common carrier regulation on mobile services, I think about a fence that actually takes everything that we just described in terms of the use of uh, these services by minority communities, and it, it closes it and embraces it and, and changes the way that we're actually seeing that growth, which actually uh, goes to my second point in terms of not upsetting the apple cart. I want to kind of pick up on what Jeff talked about in terms of the dangers of applying uh, the same rules to wireline and wireless broadband. Um, having been a person that worked in one economy and actually, you know, physically 
plugged in wireline devices back in the days in the tough streets of Chicago, you know, it's different. And wireless is nothing like wireline from a network perspective. And I think we need to be sensitive to that. Um, I'm not an engineer, but I have enough savvy to know that fiber doesn't have to worry about bandwidth changing every second. My positioning of where I'm on my phone, if I'm in transit or if I'm standing next to somebody who's downloading video, the complex and aggressive network management that we see with wireless, the wireless ecosystem, I think is something that we should consider and something that we also should be very wary of when we talk about imposing common carrier regulation or fixed regula regulation that we would put on fixed broadband onto mobile. I think that's something that recalibration often is, is sort of lost in that conversation, particularly for those of us that are not engineers. But for those of us, again, that represent constituents of color, those things are very important because they go back to whether or not we're going to have policies in place that continue to push for broadband deployment and wireless deployment. I want to go back to the early comment about spectrum. I mean, spectrum shortage, and one of the things you've seen MMTC do recently is get very involved in the spectrum debate. It is an issue because if we're talking about 89% of Hispanics and over 80% of, of African Americans heavily dependent on wireless, we've got to solve that spectrum shortage. So that disruption to, I think, the evolution of what we've seen from 2G to 3G to 4G um, in squeezing 24, 2014 regulations into some and an evolving and and a medium that's is rapidly changing again going back to my guardian analogy stifles the type of growth outward that we'd actually like to see and then my final point because I'm going to try to stay on time, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not, so somebody kick me. Um, I want to go back to what Jeff talked about in terms of the mobile environment providing the opportunity for experimentation and new business models. And this is an area, as a sociologist, I've been particularly interested in. Because at the end of the day, the regulation is, yes, about my first two points when it comes to uh, investment and innovation. But it's also about experimentation. I go back and think about prior to uh, when, when mobile first, and I, some of you can actually, I'm dating myself, I'll never tame tell my age, but I will share this example. If you all remember the day of the car phone, <laughs> when you had to carry around a big luggage bag <laughs> with your telephone in it, and when I was growing up, the only way that you had a wireless beeper is if you were a physician or some type of high-profile professional. It was completely unaffordable to have that. I just remember the south side of Chicago when they started offering beepers for like $10 a month, they were really not legal <laughs> devices. But what's been interesting, I think, in the mobile ecosystem that is worth noting for people of color is that the mobile marketplace has had to come up with strategies for competition. So we've seen the emergence of, you know, and, and, and Jeff's pointed to some of the examples, which I'll talk about, just one of them. We've seen the emergence where we've seen the waiver of early termination fees, which back in the days was not going to happen when it came to wireless services. We've seen the emergion of prepaid plans, which I, as a sociologist, I would have never imagined that we would have seen prepaid service plans on, on wireless services because at the end, in the beginning, wireless service and broadband you know, for the most part, was a was a a, 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 a form, an asset of the privileged. Let me put it that way. It was for the digital elite. And I think we've seen some experimentation in the mobile ecosystem, and we're going to continue to see more. Jeff talked about the T-Mobile uh, Music Freedom Program. MMTC, you know, came out. We, we were alerted about this program. We were told that it was a net neutrality violation. We looked at the issue carefully. We actually looked at that program with two positives. One, we were able to go to T-Mobile and say, you need to put some black stations and Latino stations in that network, which they accommodated. So thank goodness goodness for T-Mobile for listening to us. But two, it also reminded us of the fact that in this whole debate, heavier users should not be subsidized by new and late adopters to broadband. And if there are ways to actually look at the mobile ecosystem, much like the T-Mobile program and what we're seeing with the sponsored data plans, to customize for our population uh, usage plans where we're not shifting the cost to people that simply can't afford it, I think there's something to be said about that. And so we were actually proud about the T-Mobile plan because for us, Wireless, much like fixed broadband, is serving for an entry point for digital inclusion. And again, for us, it goes back to universal broadband adoption and infrastructure deployment and whether or not any regulation that comes into place is going to facilitate those outcomes. So I think that model, what we've seen earlier with Metro PCS, when they also uh, eased some of the data caps when it came to, came to Facebook, I mean, think about it. Minority consumers are over-indexing in social media. <laughs> 
Are we going to actually have those types of taxes and, you know, levies against them for wanting to participate? So I think in the end, we need to be very, very careful about looking at, and I know there's been a lot of arguments about uh, splitting the Internet and having these two Internets because you've got two different rules. I really think, and, and we sort of carry the same presumption when it comes to fixed broadband as well as many of you have read our filings, the Internet is not mature. We have a long way to go when it comes to the type of regulate, regulatory framework that we impose. And we need to be considerate of the fact that unlike telephone service, broadband is not ubiquitous. And I, I continuously tell people that because we get, you know, a lot of pushback on our opinion oftentimes. But until we see a ubiquitous service, why are we entertaining the thought, and particularly for mobile, of bringing a 1934 common carrier model to something that is really beyond the 2014 expectations of what we actually realize today. And I ask all of us in this room, and again, I speak primarily for the constituents of color who are trying to get on. Before we save the internet, I tell people, get everybody on um, the internet, and then we'll go from there. But I ask, you know, again, that we ask the FCC to be very cautious about applying the same types of rules of wireline and wireless, given the three points that I've mentioned and what's already been mentioned by the previous panelists, and I'm sure what Michael will mention uh, going forward. Any route that we take has a disproportionate impact on those consumers that are not fully included. So I'll stop there, and then we'll wait for questions and answers. Nicole, thank you very much. I'm very interested in some of those numbers that you turned down. There was a recent um, study that was published at the FCC, which takes a kind of an orthogonal cut at that, and I'd like to mention that because I think it's important. Um, and this had to do with uh, not wireless broadband, but wired broadband and its implications. Um, they studied what they were called uh, in this business non-adopters, that is to say people who have not adopted wired broadband. Um, and for those of you who don't know it, the adoption rate of wired broadband is about 70 percent of households in the United States. It's much lower than you probably thought it was. Um, and they did a, a survey of these non-adopters and they found out, get this, two facts here. One was two-thirds of them said even if it were offered for free, they wouldn't take it. My mother. <laughs> <laughs> but half of them had access to broadband wireless smartphones. Now, I'd like to put that together with your numbers here, and that says maybe you don't want wired broadband, but when you have it in your hand, it's a different situation, which is kind of the point you made. I thought that was very good. Yeah, and I mean, you know, and I do have, I think wired broadband still has, you know, important implications oh, yeah, for yeah. the ecosystem because you, there are certain things you cannot do on your smartphone that you can do through wired connection. So I think, you know, it's a balance, but for communities of color, you're completely right. We still struggle with the relevance population. As Blair Levin often says, and I said he shouldn't say it publicly, we'll just wait for those people to die off, and then, you know, everybody will adopt. <laughs> Hey, and I said, like, that's really uh, just not a politically correct way to actually put uh, that. It certainly isn't, <laughs> yes. Okay. But I think at some point that will become a non-issue. Debbie knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's Nicole, not true. you've already used up that extra two minutes. I okay. All right. Nobody's going to give me a hug, too. Okay. <laughs> no hugs here, I'll tell you that. Uh, okay. Our, our uh, final speaker is Michael Calabresi. Uh, he uh, directs the Wireless Future Project at the New America Foundation, which is a nonprofit think tank here in town, for which he serves as vice president. Now, as part of the Foundation's Open Technology Institute, he develops and advocates policies to promote ubiquitous broadband connectivity and mobile market competition. Good. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Um, well, I won't have time in 10 minutes to rebut everything the, the last three speakers have said, um, but, uh, but I would like to, you know, primarily put a you know, a new issue on the table that I think is not getting, you know, enough attention. Um, as I don't think it's been explicitly said, but I, probably everybody uh, knows that in 2010, uh, the 2010 order largely exempted uh, mobile carriers uh, from the open internet rules, uh, with the major exception of no blocking of uh, voice or video telephony that, you know, would compete with their own services it was sort of a Skype carve-out, you might say. Um, so in this NPRM, the commission has tentatively concluded to do, this, to do the same thing, uh, but it asks, well, you know, has anything changed since 2010 that might lead to a different conclusion concerning mobile parity? 
Um, so since 2010, um, you know, we maintain, and <laughs> like Jeff, probably comments that were too long, um, that the mass adoption of mobile computing devices, smartphones, tablets, and so on, uh, nationwide deployment of high-speed 4G networks, and massive Wi-Fi offload have actually changed everything. Wireline and mobile networks are converging in ways that will make it increasingly incoherent and unworkable to maintain two separate regulatory frameworks for fixed and mobile internet access. Devices are increasingly mobile, but they rely for connectivity on both mobile, mobile carrier, and increasingly more often on wireline networks. That is the same device toggling back and forth between fixed and mobile networks. In practice, the distinction between fixed and mobile networks are disappearing as consumers on untethered devices move seamlessly between the two, often during the same online session, and increasingly without even knowing what network they're on. Uh, soon, the vast majority of mobile internet traffic will be carried over wireline networks. So stop and think about that. Mobile data traffic is going to be mostly on wireline networks, and devices that your internet access will be on devices that is toggling back and forth uh, incessantly between the two. Four years ago, the inherent limitations on the capacity of a mobile carrier, uh, on the mobile carrier business model, brought cries of a uh, spectrum crisis. But four years later, the landscape has shifted radically. The rapid convergence of mobile and fixed networks, which backhaul Wi-Fi, has not only accommodated 60% annual growth rate in mobile data traffic, but it's spawning new hybrid uh, fixed mobile business models, such as we've seen the Wi-Fi first models of Republic Wireless or France's uh, Free Mobile, which is a disruptive wireless service built on Wi-Fi. Uh, these offer the promise of increasing inter-platform innovation and competition. Of course, this revolution in spectrum capacity and network convergence is attributable prim primarily to the use of Wi-Fi offload. Um, according to Cisco's, you know, annual numbers, already 50, in the U.S., 57 percent of mobile traffic is, is offloaded over fixed networks. This was last year. It's over 60 percent. In Europe, in the European, in the European Commission study, is projecting over 80 percent uh, by the end of 2016. So smartphones have become truly hybrid network devices with consumers toggling back and forth. Uh, as I mentioned, in order to optimize trade-offs between connectivity, speed, and cost. Cable and other wireline carriers, um, as a result, are developing hybrid networks that integrate Wi-Fi and can soon offer hybrid fixed and mobile services. And this may be part of what Jerry uh, was alluding to. So in France, I mentioned uh, free mobile. The parent, Iliad, uh, strictly a wireline provider originally, um, built, uh, a, 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 entered the wireless market by leveraging four, over four million residential hotspots into a disruptive low-cost mobile service. And in the cable industry here in the U.S., uh, Comcast has announced its na neighborhood hotspot initiative will have at least eight million hotspots by the end of this year, 15 million next year. Um, they could easily enter uh, the mobile uh, the mobile marketplace with a hybrid offering, again, where consumers can't even tell which network they are on. The reverse is also true. Mobile carriers are developing hetnets that will integrate cellular, wireline, and Wi-Fi, including seamless handoffs between cellular and unlicensed networks. LTE over unlicensed is a coming thing. Mobile carriers are developing technologies such as Passpoint, which allows devices to automatically authenticate and connect to Wi-Fi access points, nothing manual, nothing you see, and seamless session transfer, which uh, will maintain data sessions as the device moves back and forth between cellular and Wi-Fi networks. In addition to this, mobile carrier 4G Internet access is increasingly being marketed as a substitute for, for wireline offerings, particularly for, for DSL. So what you see is, for example, Verizon's Home Fusion, AT&T's wireless home phone and internet. Um, they're marketed as, as substitute for, quote, DSL internet service. And with mobile speeds increasing, 
so-called fixed and mobile networks uh, will be increasingly competing. Uh, and these speeds have increased dramatically. The, the FCC's report in June, uh, reported in June that 38 million mobile connections have download speeds of at least 10 megabits per second. So I would like to, uh, I, I think, I see how much more time I have here, a few more minutes. Yeah, is, uh, is mentioned two other, um, two other points. Uh, that kind of respond to arguments that carriers are, are emphasizing. First, carriers, um, I think, uh, emphasize that it's impractical or even impossible uh, to have the open Internet rules apply to them because of the constraints, constraints of limited spectrum, uh, mobile users who are kind of moving around, of course, and, and thus unpredictable demand, especially peak demand. Um, while technological differences might be relevant in applying the open Internet rules, uh, we believe that such differences don't have, you know, really should not have any bearing on whether a given obligation applies in the first place. So flex as long as there's flexibility in the application of a reasonable network management exception, it can address any legitimate differences among networks as it has with video and voice telephony applications already and as it does in the fixed world between satellite and cable and uh, WISP providers who are providing fixed wireless over unlicensed spectrum. They're all subject to the fixed open Internet uh, provisions, and yet they have very different technologies. So, the, you know, the, the crux would come down to can LTE as a technology treat like applications alike? So, in other words, even if it, has, even if it needs in a certain sell at a certain time to prioritize latency sensitive uh, uh, calling, for example, or video chats um, over video downloads, will it treat all, you know, like applications alike so that it's, it's not business model prioritization, it's just technical prioritization. And then my final point concerns uh, carrier claims that the allegedly intense competition between them makes open internet rules completely unnecessary because the market, the marketplace of course will punish practices that consumers don't like. So uh, I think three quick rejoinders to that. First is that effective competition would not diminish the rationale for basic rules of the road. Uh, as Tom Wheeler told CTIA a month ago, competition does not assure openness. And one reason it does not is that even where carriers compete hard for subscribers, mobile ISPs have a common interest in seeking rents from adjacent market providers for applications, content, services, and in securing a competitive advantage for their own apps, contents, and services. Uh, finally, and most importantly, the, the predicate of their argument uh, that there is intense competition is certainly, it's just simply not true and increasingly less true. So the mobile market has grown steadily more concentrated and less competitive since 2010, which is why it's been precisely in those years since that the FCC's annual uh, wireless competition report has declined to find the market effectively competitive. The antitrust division has twice uh, publicly stated that they, they find it highly concentrated. And perhaps most tellingly, in FCC filings, the Competitive Carriers Association, that is everybody but AT&T and Verizon, has said things including, for example, they, it's alarming that consolidation, as measured by the Herfindahl-Hirschman Index, for example, has increased from around 2,100 to around 2,900 uh, since 2003. Uh, indicating a highly concentrated market. 2,500 is highly concentrated. And that's even higher now after the, metro, after the acquisition of Metro PCS by T-Mobile, of Leap by AT&T. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much done. AT&T and Verizon have two-thirds of total industry revenue. And what's interesting is last December, uh, Steve Barry, the president of Competitive Carriers Association, uh, called for a wireless competitive task force to address this crisis in, in, in wireless competition. And, and he said, he said that um, just a few years ago, this is a quote, just a few years ago, the U.S. wireless industry enjoyed robust competition 
Unfortunately, the market has changed, and we are in imminent danger of re reverting back to the duopoly of its early days. So competition is not going to be a panacea, even if it did exist. Uh, the application of a reasonable network management exception can be tailored to mobile, so we have the same principles either way, and it would just be increasingly incoherent and unworkable uh, given where the blurring between wired and wireline networks to try to have two internets and two different regulatory regimes. Thank it. you, Michael. Good. Thank you for the panel. Good. Um, would you guys like to have at each other? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ross, uh, the, the uh, point was made here about, gee, let's regulate, uh, I think, if I'm going to characterize Michael's position, let's regulate everything alike because it's beginning to look more and more alike. And if there really are differences with mobile, well, we can just maybe forbear a little bit. Uh, is, what do you think about that? Right. Well, just legally speaking, I don't think Michael talking, was talking about forbearance in the Section 10 of the Act. I think he was talking about applying the standard differently, having some sort of reasonableness standard, yeah, and recognizing the differences. Uh, and and with due respect to Michael, and I, I do greatly respect him and his and the work of New America, I don't think that works. And part of the reason it doesn't work is illustrated by Nicole's comment that they were appro MMTC was approached saying, look at music freedom. This is bad. Please decide this is bad. Well, who approached them? She didn't say. I'm guessing it may have been people like the folks at Public Knowledge and uh, maybe EFF and uh, maybe others who came out saying music freedom is bad and came out saying AT&T sponsored data is bad. Um, those and, and I realize those were business models more than the technical issues, but the same principle applies. There are groups that uh, instinctively criticize these, these kind of practices and under a regime where uh, wireless providers, mobile providers were subject to a reasonableness requirement, they would most likely have filed complaints at the FCC. Now, I think the response from Michael is, okay, but if they can demonstrate it's reasonable, they could win. Uh, the problem is winning isn't everything. And, you know, Jeff Pulver earlier was talking a little bit about the Pulver order. Uh, when he introduced free world dial-up, he actually, Pulver affirmatively went to the commission uh, seeking treatment as an information service, but it was because people were coming and saying, this is telecom and you should be regulated and you should be doing this and that. Going through those processes itself takes a lot of time. Um, Firms like mine make a lot of money, frankly, because these legal proceedings take take up a lot of resources. Uh, my daughter's college fund benefits, but the public doesn't benefit when when that happens. And uh, the, the risk. So, so there's two things, I guess. One is the time and expense that companies have to go through uh, litigating case after case after case, which I think is what we see will happen. Uh, and second is the chilling effect. So companies look at, and this is another thing that makes a lot of money for folks like me, when people call and say, can I do this? And we write memos and we have conference calls and we f you know, furrow down into the issues. That's, again, good for lawyers, but it takes up a lot of resources. And ultimately, when you say, well, there's a 50% chance that uh, the FCC is going to find this unlawful and maybe fine you down the road, or at the very least tell you to stop doing this business that you've invested a lot of money in, that has a real chilling effect on the kind of innovation that we've seen. So even going, the suggestion that going through the process itself is not costly is problematic. Um, second, so Michael said that the technical issues don't affect the business model cases. Well, the business model cases, I think, we are things we, we want. As, as Nicole said, uh, music freedom, uh, so I do some work for T-Mobile, I should say, <laughs> but music freedom uh, is a service that lets people who, let, frankly, it lets people who rely on mobile services buy lower level tiers, right? I, I might need to buy the five gigabyte tier if I really wanted to stream my music without it, and maybe I can buy the two or three gigabyte tier per month without it. Um, that's a benefit and that promotes deploy it promotes not only deployment, it, pr it promotes adoption and promotes use by these at-risk communities. Uh, I, I would think that that's what we, what we would want. Um, and third, I, I guess I query the, the claim about the wireless providers having a competitive, having a joint interest in seeking rents from adjacent markets. I'm sorry, I don't query that they have incentive. All, all, peop, all market actors do. But the milk industry has a collective interest in extracting rents from consumers as well. What stops them from doing it is that they compete against one another. So we love the milk industry as a whole would love to keep prices up here, but provider A gets prices down here to get more of the share, and provider B boosts. And, that, and that's how markets work. And, and um, putting aside the empirical question, although, frankly, I think something like 85% of Americans have access to four or more mobile service providers, uh, but putting aside the empirical question of where competition is at, the idea that even effective competition wouldn't get there uh, strikes me as misplaced. Can I make a, a quick response on the zero rating? Yeah, go ahead. Because it might 
I don't know, may, may add something to it, which is, as Russ said, it's good regulatory, you know, clear lines rather than uncertainty. I, I completely agree with that. And one thing I, I you know, I'd, I'd actually will concede on, on, the, on the zero rating issue is that the FCC will have a, a t I think, would have a tough decision between two types of zero rating. There's zero rating where money changes hands and where it doesn't. Um, you know, you, you're, of course, emphasizing something like T-Mobile's Music Freedom or the free Facebook in the third world where money does not change hands. Where it does change hands, it's just backdoor paid prioritization, um, paid prioritization by different means. And so, you know, that should be outlawed. It's a much tougher call where uh, it, it's, a, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a free, uh, it's so, sort of a free add-on, uh, you know, for the reasons uh, that you said. So I just throw that out there. Is that kind of on this? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, Nicole, wait a minute, Nicole, oh. I want to get to you. Cause you Did you want to add on this part? Because I want to talk about the hybrid networks. <laughs> well, let me address that last, that last point really quickly, and then uh, uh, really quickly, you know. Uh, uh, I, I mean, what, what you just said, Michael, um, uh, that <clears throat> that if there's a payment, it's just a you know, backdoor paid prioritization and it ought to be banned. Based on what? I mean, uh, there, there are innumerable potential benefits from exactly the exchange of payments rather than its absence. Like, for example, the ability to, to literally prioritize newer services that may not be well known. It's, it's effective promotion and marketing. It may actually provide startup capital. Uh, Baron and I recently wrote an article about this hypothetical I hollow startup, uh, but the gist of that was to say this kind of paid prioritization may be precisely how innovation on the very edge actually uh, gets financed in the future and even in the present. Um, the idea that somehow that, that you know a transfer of, of payments leading to prioritization um, makes it bad, but if there's no payment, it's okay. Um, that that I mean that I think that's um, I think that's com completely unsupported by uh, by by the reality. In addition to it, if it were going to be adopted, being an impossible position for the FCC to be in to try to distinguish between those, especially when the mechanism of payments will be varied and difficult to see. Right. And uh, it, you'll end up with absolute discrimination. Right. So I, I just want to, so you, Michael and I have known each other and we've talked a lot about for a long time on this network and where networks sort of interconnect and where they split off. And I think all of us have seen this hybrid model that you discussed, which I think is really interesting, right? And Chris is shaking his head because back in the days when you were talking about white spaces and unlicensed, those were like, abstract concepts that now we're seeing this this traffic off up, offloads actually occurring but I think it's a slippery slope though to actually suggest that um, going forward that the FCC sort of commingle those things much like what was discussed in the first panel about well we'll regulate up until this certain point because then you have to kind of define what parts of the slippery slope you actually regulate right when we're really at this point looking at hybrid models more as a traffic flow issue and how we manage when people do um, you know I've talked about this right when they move from place to place consumers are not seeing those offloads right and I don't really know and I'm not really sure if the FCC can adequately regulate which part is a switch on and switch off you know for different companies Company. So I would just caution how we actually look at that model. I think um, I agree with you that the uh, uh, prioritization when it comes to network management is essential, particularly in the mobile world, and they need that 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 type of um, ability to have the, to manage those rigorous networks. But I would just caution, you know, in that, and not this is not you know yeah. refute Mike stuff, but <laughs> I would caution the hybrid network and really saying you know putting out an assertion that it's so con conjoined. That regulation could actually monitor both. Uh, I just don't think that's possible. Michael will get back at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I know. I feel bad. I was like. <laughs> Although what's, what's interesting is, is is that that's that's part of what we actually argue as well. Um, so the cable, if you go look in the cable industry uh, comments, they say, well, look, if you're going to have a, a separate regulatory framework, then Wi-Fi needs to be treated like mo mobile access. It needs to be exempt from any open internet uh, rules. So what does that, that, that's, that paves the way for a complete workaround because already, right, the cable industry is putting, uh, a, a, is, put, is forcing you to have a Wi-Fi router um, right at the entry point to your home for their other customers. So, so how many feet away, so Wi-Fi is just wireless ethernet, right? It's just, instead of plugging in, you just back off and don't, and don't use the wire. How many, the FCC is gonna have to decide how many feet away from the router 
from the connection do you need to be in, when it magically transforms from a fixed service into a mobile service? Mm -hmm. So there's these questions like this we raise in our reply comments in particular and that the cable industry raises, which is just crazy, I mean, to have these two different regulatory frameworks. One more. You'll get the last word. Go ahead, Russ. Um, Michael just used the word workaround, and, and I think implicit in that word and implicit in some of the debate on this point is the presumption that, you know, that customers of mobile broadband services will have less good, less open, less free services than others. And I, I want to push back against that a little bit. I, given the technological issues that we've talked about and Jeff talked about, limitations in the wireless space, and given the, the degree of competition there is, mobile providers don't see it as we want to be able to provide less open service. What they see is, in the kind of market we're in, the way to protect consumers, the way to advance consumers' interests, offerings, again, like sponsored data or mobile freedom, the way to do that is to free us to act you know, subject to the market's dictates rather than subject to sort of constraining rules. The FCC, under both Democrats and Republicans, has repeatedly said regulation is no substitute for competition. And when we have, Chairman Wheeler says this a lot, when we have competition, we want to sort of get out of the way and let it work. So I, I, I want to push back against the notion that different rules for wireless means wireless customers are disadvantaged, when what it really means, I think, is that given the circumstances, diff differential regimes is the way to get wireless customers to be on par with, or in some cases ahead, ahead of the game with respect to others. You know, that's not, just a quick thing, and that's not what the, what the track record um, shows, because I, I think you had it right at the beginning when you taught, when you made the distinction between business model uh, prioritization and technical or engineering prioritization. Because what the mobile carriers have demonstrated over the past few years is that they are just chomping at the bit to do business model prioritization. And they've had to be slapped back s several times on that, even though the wireline guys you know, have, been, uh, have been observing the rules. So two, two quick examples, FaceTime. And both of these, by the way, undercut what Nicole was saying about how somehow having um, not having mobile parity is good for low-income and minority folks. Okay, first, uh, FaceTime, AT&T, uh, was, was, um, was allowing use of face, FaceTime app on iPhones only for its high-end customers and not for its low-end customers until a couple of our groups drafted a complaint that, you know, Chairman Janikowski, you know, almost went through the roof and basically forced AT&T to back off that so that they would actually allow FaceTime mm -hmm. for Nicole's folks. And, AT and Verizon was fined one point, when they wouldn't back off, was fined $1.25 million for blocking tethering apps. So these same folks who can't afford to buy both a, an expensive high capacity wireline connection at home and an expensive mobile plan might want to use their, their smartphone for tethering. Uh, they were being blocked from that because they wanted to sell it as something separate. Uh, and under the C-block rules, they could not, they were fined. So you just see that unlike the wireline world, the wireless guys really are looking for this business model prioritization. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let's, <laughs> really let's understand, yeah. we're keeping these people from lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're keeping them from their questions. There right, we but, go. We hundreds of them. But, but if I could just say one thing, just real quick, since Michael did put the <laughs> question to me. That? I'm sorry, I'm a woman, I probably got a little bit more power in that. I'm the woman, you're the man. <laughs> I think those are really good examples, and I think that's, I mean, part of what MMTC has said, too, that some of those examples are um, nominal, that they, and they are being worked out in the marketplace. And I think that's the same thing that we experienced with the T-Mobile Music Freedom Program, right? It got worked out without having to have a regulatory framework that stifled the innovation that we're seeing. And I think that's, I mean, part of this whole debate that we're all in on this now is really the balance between uh, the extent to which you know, we all have put out there that discrimination is bad, right? But the approach in which we actually uh, go about it and what the cost implication will be in the end. So I, I agree with you that we have to constantly look at those examples and handle them on a case-by-case basis, but I, I don't agree that we have to put in stringent regulation that will stifle everything, all the good that's actually coming out of the ecosystem as so well. So let's hear it for our panel. Yeah.